start now. Uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, sorry, not <laughs> evening. Uh, good afternoon and welcome, rather, um, to Cafe de Flore. Cafe de Flore is a server dedicated to education and debate where we discuss issues in philosophy, politics, the sciences, and the arts. Uh, my name is Stephen, and today we're joined by Dr. James N. Anderson, who has generously agreed to take some time out of his day to field questions from our community regarding his work and philosophical views. Um, a recording of today's Q&A will eventually be hosted on the Cafe de Flore YouTube channel, a link to which can be found on my Twitter at twitter.com slash shinybaboon, where I also post announcements about upcoming events like this. Um, but with all that being said, allow me to briefly introduce our guest. Um, Dr. Anderson is the Carl W. McMurray Professor of Theology and Philosophy at the Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he specializes in philosophical theology, religious epistemology, and Christian apologetics. Uh, his doctoral thesis explored the paradoxical nature of certain Christian doctrines and the implications for the rationality of Christian faith, and his research and writing have also focused on Sorry about that. I uh, I dropped out there, I think. But um, his doctoral thesis explored the paradoxical nature of certain Christian doctrines and the implications for the rationality of Christian faith. And his research and writing have also focused on the presuppositionalism of Cornelius Van Til, particularly, particularly his advocacy of the transcendental argument. Uh, Dr. Anderson, would you like to add anything to the introduction I just gave before we move on? No, that was great. Thank you. Okay, uh, excellent. So now we'll be moving into the audience Q&A, where I'll be reading out a series of questions submitted by community members, and in some cases, I'll temporarily be bringing users onto the stage here to ask their questions directly or voice chat. For those in the live audience, be sure to add the abbreviation VC somewhere in your message, um, or otherwise indicate to me that you want to ask over voice if you want to be brought on stage. So with all that out of the way, are you ready to begin, Dr. Anderson? Yeah, I think so. OK, excellent. So um, our first questioner here. Um, since he said he wanted to go first because he has to go soon, um, Dog wanted to ask you some questions, I think. So we'll see if he's able to to speak here. Um, Dog, are you able to are you able to actually accept the request to speak? Because he said he's having issues and not seeing the channel. So um, let me just see real quick if he's able to see anything. If not, then we'll have to move on to someone else, at least for the time being, unless he can figure something out. Um, hang on, I'm asking him if he's able to accept it. All right, it seems like we might have to move on, uh, unfortunately. But maybe we'll come back to him if he's able to, uh, if he's able to fix the issue later. So we'll move on to, um, to a text question, actually. So, uh, GIG asks, Dr. Anderson, will you please go into a little detail about what the adverbial account is for God's thoughts? Okay, so uh, this has to do with my defense of uh, theistic conceptual realism, which is roughly the view that um, propositions are, are divine thoughts. And there's a long argument behind that, but um, the question, can I actually see the question in the chat? Let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, if you scroll oh, okay, to the top. Right, G -I -G, right, okay. Uh, a little detail about what the ad adverbial account is for God's thoughts. Okay, so the idea is that, um, that uh, God's uh, thoughts are not things or entities that are parts of God, but rather they are a special category of divine actions, uh, specifically mental actions or intellectual activity. So if we say that the proposition two plus two equals four, for example, we'll take that as an instance of a, a true proposition, to say that that's a divine thought is to say that uh, that proposition is in fact God's act of thinking in a certain way, thinking uh, in a way, in a, to put it crudely, in a two plus two equals four way. Um, so this is, this is a way of preserving divine simplicity. So we don't want to say that uh, God's thoughts are part of God or they somehow are entities that compose up God or part of God. 
um, but rather uh, that uh, divine thoughts are are God's mental activities, and the adverbial account allows us a way of of expressing that um, that that certain propositions, specific propositions, ultimately reduce to God God's thinking in certain ways. Uh, so that's the, that's the core of the adverbial account. Um, will I go on and answer the next part of this question? Yeah, you can do that if you want. All right, I see. If thoughts for God can have an adverbial account, why not the same for humans? Well, sure, they could. I mean, you could adopt an adverbial account of human thoughts, but even then, human thoughts are uh, not going to have the the kind of properties that would allow them to play the role of propositions. Um, so the the move to adopt an adverbial account of divine thoughts uh, has a certain rationale behind it related to the nature of God and divine simplicity. And uh, the adverbial account for human thoughts could well be adopted, but at the end of the day, human thoughts uh, still lack the kind of properties like uh, necessity, uh, plenitude, um, objectivity that we need for an adequate account of propositions. All right. That's, um, that's, that's my basic answer. All right. And do you want to um, do you want to answer his other question as well? Um, how do you answer when someone claims God is only a mechanism because he never fails? Have you heard this objection before? No, I've never heard that objection before. I think um, the implication is that, like, if God um, is a mechanism, um, then he doesn't have agency or something and doesn't have thoughts. Okay. Uh, something along those lines. It, it, it looks like that's a logical fallacy because it seems to be arguing a mechanism is something that never fails. God never fails. Therefore, he is a mechanism or only a mechanism. But that's clearly a non sequitur. I mean, maybe there's something more sophisticated behind it. I mean, if you're going to define mechanism, a mechanism as, as something that never fails, sure, okay, on that really idiosyncratic definition of mechanism, then maybe you could say God is a mechanism. But, you know, that's not our usual understanding of a mechanism. A mechanism is some sort of um, construction of, of parts that performs functions and does so in a deterministic or law-like fashion. Um, but I don't think... I don't think that that captures uh, God's activity on a number of counts because uh, God isn't composed of parts. God, I would say God still has free agency. Certainly, um, there are some things that the God cannot do because they would be cons inconsistent with his nature. But God is still able to uh, exercise free agency. And when he when he wills something, it doesn't. Uh, he doesn't fail. God doesn't uh, embark on courses of action that that don't succeed, at least in my view. But I don't. I don't associate that with a mechanistic view. Seems like there's some sort of semantic um, jiggery pokery going on here to try and uh, attach the label mechanism to God. But I haven't heard this objection before, so I'm just spitballing here. All right. Um, so we can move on to Yuffie's questions now. Um, Yuffie says, good to see you here, Dr. Anderson. Uh, should Vantillian apologists settle for a modest transcendent, transcendental argument in response to Stroud? Wow, well, that's, that's a great question. It's one that might need quite a bit of unpacking for some folks here if they're not clear on the background. So, um, so Barry Sproud uh, is a philosopher who had a very influential objection to the idea of a transcendental argument and uh, basically argued that uh, a, a transcendental argument that, that tries to solve skeptical problems either has to embrace idealism, uh, the view that uh, reality is somehow mind-dependent or truths are mind-dependent, uh, or has to accept a verificationist principle that could confirm the link between the way things appear and the way things really are. But a verificationist principle would would solve the skeptical problem on itself on its own without a transcendental argument. And so 
Uh, some have argued that, well, we need to distinguish between strong transcendental arguments that are able to establish how things really are, uh, to get to rock bottom reality, we might say, as opposed to a modest transcendental argument that argues that um, things have to appear a certain way or that we have to believe certain things or we have to take certain things for granted. Um, so the question is, should a Vantillian apologist who wants to uh, establish a transcendental argument for the existence of God, would they have to settle for a modest transcendental argument? I think a lot of things could be said here, but uh, one is that the kind of transcendental arguments that Stroud was targeting were anti-skeptical arguments raised against the claim that we know that there is some external objective world and independent reality. So uh, those kind of transcendental arguments are meant to defeat things like Descartes' demon, um, matrix scenarios, uh, the idea that, that our experiences don't really make contact with, with reality, with the way things really are. Whereas a Vantillian transcendental argument is, is targeting not skepticism about the external world per se, or about the, um, the veridicality of our experiences, but rather the, the existence of God. So it's targeting the atheist claim that there is no, there is no God, if we define an atheism in those terms. And so I think one can argue still that certain uh, intellectual activities that we engage in, uh, reasoning, um, using logical argumentation, um, knowledge claims, we can still argue that these presuppose the existence of God. And uh, that seems to be, I think, a pretty significant result in itself. If, if we have a transcendental argument that says, uh, or that shows that certain cognitive activities that we engage in um, presuppose or uh, entail in some sense the existence of God, uh, and that to deny the existence of God would lead to uh, the vitiation of those cognitive acti activities or would render them impossible in some respect. That seems like uh, a, a pretty significant result. Um, and if you want to call that a modest transcendental argument, then sure, that's fine. It still seems um, uh, a pretty significant uh, conclusion to be able to establish. So I think there's something of a category error when when this question is raised, um, because the, as I say, the kind of transcendental arguments and the sort of the conclusions of transcendental arguments that Stroud has in mind are are not the same as Van Til had in mind. Now, the other kind of response one could make is to say that one has to, one, one could indeed settle for a form of idealism. And in Christian philosophy, there has been a respectable tradition of Christian idealism. That is to say, the view that um, all of, all of uh, everything that exists is ultimately mind dependent. And I think for a Christian theist, there's, there has, you have to draw that conclusion in some respect. If, if God is the creator of all things and, and, and God is an absolute mind or possesses an absolute mind, then sure, everything, everything is going to be dependent on the mind of God in some respect. Uh, the question is, to what extent uh, reality is dependent on, on human minds? And well, that's, an, that's a pretty involved question. Um, the, the second part of this uh, person's question is, what do, what do you see as the prospects and pitfalls of Christian idealism as it figures in recent philosophical theology? Yeah, um, honestly, I haven't looked a great deal into some of these recent attempts to resurrect uh, a Christian idealism of the, uh, of the type that George Barclay held or Jonathan Edwards. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a respectable position. I think it's harder to refute than many people think. Um, I'm not attracted to it myself because I do think it's counterintuitive to say that material objects don't exist independently of our perceptions of them. Um, I don't see any problem with positing 
the existence of material objects that are not dependent on human perceptions or human cognitive activity or human ideas, as long as they are dependent on God's continual sustaining activity. But I do get a bit nervous at some suggestions that uh, the creation itself is nothing more than an idea in the mind of God. That's the sort of language that gets me kind of nervous. Um, Jonathan Edwards says some things along those lines that God's act of creation is in fact an act of simply an act of thought or imagination so that all created beings turn out to be in some sense uh, ideas in the mind of God. That to me blurs the creator creature distinction and I'm not sure I can even make sense of the fact that other other minds could reduce to just thoughts in a divine mind. I'm I'm not sure of the coherence of that. But it is it is a position that uh, a number of pretty sharp Christian philosophers are trying to work out today and defend. So it it, it deserves some attention, but I'm not particularly attracted to it. All right. Um and now the person that uh, that wanted to talk before says that they have um, solved the issue. Actually, wait, they don't appear to be here right now. I don't know what happened. So I'll go on to we'll go on to the next question for now uh, from Kayak. Uh, Dr. Anderson, how would you establish that the necessary precondition for logic is personal? Uh, OK, I'm just going to scroll up here. Oh, I think I've gone to the wrong channel here. OK. Uh, so the question, uh, how would you establish that the necessary precondition for logic is personal? Well, I do, I do make the argument for that in the paper that I co-authored co with Greg Welty, uh, the, the Lord of Non-Contradiction. Basically, what we argue is that um, the laws of logic are necessary truths, and necessary truths uh, ha, should be understood as necessarily existent thoughts, or at least um, uh, we can argue that if there are necessary truths, then they would be necessarily existent thoughts. And thoughts can't exist independently of minds. If there's a thought, then there has to be a mind having that thought. And it seems to me a natural uh, next step to argue that if there is a mind then there is a person who has that mind i i find it hard to make sense of a uh, a mind that that doesn't belong to a person that doesn't have a uh, a subject a conscious subject of some kind who is entertaining those thoughts or holding those thoughts uh, if someone can give me a, an example a non-question begging example of a mind that isn't possessed by a person. I guess I would have to entertain that uh, a bit more seriously. But as far as I know, the, the only kinds of minds that are able to entertain the thoughts that we need to have all the propositions that we are familiar with, the sort of propositions that the argument deals with, um, our personal minds, uh, our human minds, or something that goes beyond uh, a human mind. So it's going to be minimally personal. But I think we can also perhaps augment the argument with other kinds of theistic arguments. I think uh, we can argue that, uh, that uh, if, for example, if there are objective moral obligations, some version of the moral argument is is going to point us to a, a grounding for moral obligations that is transcendent and is personal, because I, I don't see how moral obligations can be generated by non-personal or impersonal sources. Um, moral obligations can only come from um, agents with in, intentions and desires, will. So, uh, we could sort of broaden the argument to bring in other considerations, not just logical norms, but moral norms as well. And then I think that even better establishes that uh, the God who would stand behind these things must be personal in nature. I think that's enough to say about it. All right. Thank you. Um, 
so now the dog is finally here um, and requesting to speak. So uh, I think I should be able to bring him to the uh, stage. There he is. Hello. hello. Um, you're a little bit quiet. Um, okay, how about now? Is this better? Can you hear him all right, Dr. Anderson? Or is he still? Yeah, I can. He's a bit quiet, but I can. I can hear him. All right, we can yes, try. Yes, hello, uh, Dr. Anderson. Um, my question, my question. Well, I have several questions, but one of my questions is simply, uh, why do you think it, it would be better to assume that logic is uh, uh, some property or principle contained in God's thoughts? as opposed to uh, perhaps taking some other view? Like, what is the primary motivation? Well, the, the, the primary motivation is that we, we are looking for an, an adequate metaphysical account of propositions in general. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the paper in which Dr. Welty and I argue from the laws of logic to the existence of God. But the way we set things up is that we take the laws of logic to be paradigms of necessary truths. So yeah. it, we argue that if there are if there are laws of logic, then they would be they would be truths and they would be necessary truths. And a truth is a, a true proposition. It's a proposition that, that has the property of being true. And so we develop the argument from there that uh, if there are necessary truths and there are necessarily existent thoughts and these must be the thoughts of god they can't be merely human thoughts so if you uh if you think that there's some competing account of propositions that um better satisfies the desiderata for a good account of propositions then sure we could talk about that well i mean presumably it, it sounds like it's going to run into an issue that um, someone like Frege uh, argued would, um, would also, that our thoughts also run into, which is that if our thoughts are intentional, right, and we have thoughts or beliefs about proposition, right, if you have two beliefs about this proposition, well, presumably the proposition is, is going to be something external to the two uh, entities, you know, you, it, it's not going to be grounded merely in their beliefs since their beliefs are private and can't be shared, right? So, in the case of God, why wouldn't that just run afoul of the same objection where it's like, well, what are his thoughts about? Okay, I think there are, there are two uh, issues here and yeah, we should try to distinguish them and I, I think perhaps you're your source for some of these objections would be Alex Malpass's um, paper. Maybe I, you I came up with these. I actually haven't read Alex Malpass's paper, but I, I, for, people tell me this is an objection Alex Malpass. Okay. So, well, one is the issue of, um, of private public thoughts. So uh, the objection is, well, thoughts are necessarily private, um yeah. and uh, not public but propositions have to be public and so divine thoughts would also have to be private and they, so they couldn't play the role of um of propositions i don't think that's a good objection at all because any thought can be perfectly well made public um you know, I have the thought that two plus two equals four. You have the thought that two plus two equals four. There's obviously a yeah. sense in which my thoughts are private in that they belong to me, but there's a there's a shared content there. The shared content is yeah. the proposition that two plus two equals four. So there has, from a human perspective, there has to be a a proposition that exists independently of our thoughts. And part of the reason is because the truth itself is independent of me. Two plus two, would, two plus two equals four would be true whether I was thinking it or not, whether I even existed or not. So that proposition has to exist independently of my thoughts and the same goes for any other contingent being. But that's not the case for God. For God, uh, God's thoughts are necessary. Uh, they exist necessarily because God thinks uh, exists necessarily. And, uh, and so, 
Um, there's no problem there in saying that propositions are ultimately identified with divine thoughts, and they may be intrinsically private in the sense that they, they ultimately belong to God and God alone, but God, of course, can reveal truths to us. I mean, that's just the concept of divine revelation itself. There's a sense in which our knowledge of any true proposition is a kind of divine revelation if that truth is ultimately a divine thought. Um, I think there is another objection you're, you're trying to press here that we have to posit a distinction between the thought and the proposition that serves as the content of that thought. Am I right? Is that partly yeah. what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, the reason we have to do that in the human case is precisely for the reasons that I just laid out, that these truths have to hold independently of us because we are contingent. Necessary truths like two plus two equals four, um, they can't depend on my mind, they can't depend on your mind, uh, because they have an objectivity that indicates that they are independent of our thinking and independent of our existence. We have to make that distinction between the proposition itself and the and the content. Uh, sorry, the proposition itself and the thought that is having that that has that proposition as content. But the same problems don't arise for divine thoughts, and so there's there's actually no need to distinguish between a divine thought and some propositional content. We simply say that the divine thought is the proposition itself. Um, there's I don't see any any issue with saying that because because divine well, thoughts have characteristics very different than human thoughts. Okay, I I see. Um, well, then, um, I mean, I have a few more questions. Um, what would be the truth maker for God's thoughts? Like, and if He's thinking uh, the law yeah. of non-contradiction is true, what's the truth maker for that? Well, first. I have to point out that whether all truths have truth makers is itself a disputed issue. Okay, so um, it's it's possible that some truths don't in fact have truth makers. That's certainly an option here. But it, uh, if we're going to take the route that all truths have to have truth makers, it really depends, I think, on the on the kind of truth itself. So, for example. Uh, if God, if God uh, thinks that a certain tree is a certain height, the truth maker for that, of course, is the existence of the tree itself and the tree having the properties. And that's something that God would have created, right? So that's fairly straightforward. Yeah. But if we're talking about something like the, the laws of logic, I'm, I'm probably going yeah. to say that the truth, those truth makers or truth makers for necessary truths that are independent of created realities, that God himself is the truth maker. That is, the, the laws of logic are, um, are in a sense a reflection of, the, of, of certain attributes of, of God, um, what we would refer to as God's the consistency, the consistency of God's thoughts is expressed by the laws of logic. Now, if you say, well, that's kind of uh, circular because we're, we're sort of explaining logic in terms of consistency and these are just related terms or synonymous terms, then I, yeah. I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what more there is to say because um, you, at some point you hit ground bottom uh, with, um, with certain concepts that you, you can't further define them or explain them in terms of more fundamental things. So if, if, if God himself is the truth maker for necessary truths, then I think we have hit rock bottom, metaphysically speaking, and uh, I'm not sure what else there is to say about in answer to that question. Yeah, well, Wait, I mean, quick, I guess- dog, one... uh, if, you could give, if you could give like one more, uh, like one last response or, or maybe one more quick question and then we need to move on because- okay, like, almost okay. 10... Yeah, well, I, I, I guess, I mean, you kind of already uh, addressed the circularity there. I mean, but one issue I have is simply that um, when it comes to your know, true propositions, I mean, somebody could just deny that um, we, we need in order to think that 
it is the case that logic always holds. We don't necessarily need to grant that um, it's some sort of necessarily existing proposition. We could just say that the truth maker always holds. And so if somebody were to think of a proposition, you know, hypothetically, it would be a true proposition, right? So we could give them some kind of account like that, right? So okay. if it's the case, yeah, so for example, if it's the case that uh, there was like a necessarily existing tree or something like that, whatever, right? And somebody and somebody asked, well, is the proposition that there's a necessarily existing tree always true? What we could say is that, well, the proposition itself wouldn't always have existed, right? It only existed when you said the proposition or thought of it. However, the truth maker would always, right? The tree would always okay. exist. Yeah. And that's, it would be always a true proposition. And in that yeah. case, I don't see why the naturalist couldn't just ground something like logic in something natural. You know, like, you're like Graham Oppie. You believe that nature is necessarily existing. So right. you say it's some structural attribute of nature, some sort of structural. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, actually. And that's that's a really important part of the discussion, um, whether you need necessarily existent propositions to account for these necessary truths or whether you just need some sort of um, objective metaphysical necessity that isn't propositional in nature and the propositions themselves are just contingent entities that we we generate with our minds so maybe in the case of the laws of logic the laws of logic aren't actually propositions they are just um, some sort of uh, metaphysical necessities, some sort of necessary state of affairs or some necessary feature of reality. And then uh, we, we generate propositions about them by thinking about them. And those, those propositions uh, are themselves contingent, even though they describe uh, some, some sort of metaphysical necessity. Well, I think... Um, I think that gets you out of maybe some parts of the argument, but not others, because there are certain other features of propositions that we need to account for. And one is the, the objectivity of propositions. That is to say that when two or more people are entertaining the same proposition, that proposition itself can't be a divine thought. So take two plus two equals four again. Um, I I believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4. You believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4, I assume. Um, our thoughts, in terms of mental activity, are distinct. But there's only one proposition there. There are, there's more than one thought, because there's more than one thinker in our case. But the proposition itself, the proposition is objective rather than subjective. Uh, it's, it's independent of us as thinkers. Um, so the objectivity aspect of propositions still needs to be accounted for. The, the, the propositions need to have an objective existence that allows us to uh, have commonality, to share thoughts about one and the same proposition. Because if, if, if my thought that two plus two equals four and your thought that two plus two equals four, if there's nothing above and beyond those thoughts, if there's no common content to those thoughts, then it makes no sense to say that we're having the same thought or that we're thinking about the same proposition or that we're agreed about the same truth. There, there has to be some objectivity to the true proposition itself. Another issue is uh, what Greg Welty calls the, the plenitude of propositions, namely that there are many, many more propositions than there are human thoughts or could be human thoughts. So a good example would be... Um, uh, well, you can you can generate some trivial examples like uh, propositions about all of the natural numbers. There's an infinite number of natural numbers, and you could you could say that there is a truth. There are many truths about every natural number. Uh, take the number one. The number one uh, isn't uh, isn't identical to the Eiffel Tower. The number two isn't identical to the Eiffel Tower, and so on. Uh, you've trivially proven that there are an infinite number of true propositions. But, of course, no contingent mind, no human mind, uh, can accommodate all of those truths. And it, it's fairly obvious that there are many, many complex mathematical truths 
that are object hold objectively but can't be entertained by a limited human mind so you've not just got the necessity of propositions you've also got the the uh, objectivity and the plenitude of propositions that a a human conceptualist account or a finite conceptualist account isn't going to be able to accommodate that was a bit lengthy but hopefully it moves the discussion forward a little bit yeah it's it's fine um you know we're used to people going into uh you know very thorough detail to answer questions and that's uh that's actually appreciated because it's better to give uh, a lot of information than to you know give too little i guess Mm. But um, thank you for your questions, dog. Uh, we'll now move on yeah. to a question from Haiku. Um, he says, thank you for coming here, Dr. Anderson. There's been some recent debate regarding how God is supposed to know he's creating you in specific during his act of creation. How is God meant to individuate me from someone else before I exist? Is there some sort of divine conceptualist answer to this? Thanks for answering. Hmm. That's a, yeah, that's a really great question. It has to do with the idea of whether there could be... Um, uh, individual essences of persons that that exist before the persons themselves. So, the, the, to to set the problem up, suppose that that God wants to uh, create me specifically. We'll leave out the story about how I come to exist. Suppose, for the sake of argument, God wants to create me just out of you know out of nothing uh, immediately. Um, would how would god know that he was creating me as opposed to some other individual who just had all the same properties as me you know you could imagine someone who isn't identical to me but nonetheless has all the same properties how how does god distinguish before the act of creation between me and someone else i mean there are different there are different ways of approaching that uh, one is to bite the bullet and say, well, actually, uh, there's a sense in which God doesn't know that it is me ind individually before I come to exist. Um, I'm not sure that that's a particularly bad bullet to bite. Um, as long as God has a, a plan, a creative plan that involves someone uh, with all the specific properties that I have that is, uh, that is qualitatively identical to me, it doesn't really matter from God's perspective whether it's me or someone else. It might matter from my perspective, I suppose, but of course, if if I didn't end up existing, I wouldn't exist to care about whether I've been exist uh, I've been brought into existence or not. So it may be that um, biting the bullet on this and saying that uh, there are no such things as individual essences that exist be before the individual itself exists. Um, and that's not really a problem for, for God in terms of accomplishing his plans and having foreknowledge and, and all the rest of it. Um, another would be to say, uh, well, you, you might be able to argue um, somewhat controversially for the um, identity of indiscernibles, which is the, um, there, there are two laws that are associated with Leibniz. One is the, the um, indiscernibility of identicals, which says that if, if two things are identical, then they must, be, they must have all the same properties. That's fairly uncontroversial. Um, it's hard to see how that could be false. Uh, a more controversial claim would be that if two, if two, um, if two things are indiscernible. If two things have absolutely all the same properties, then they are in fact identical. They are numerically identical. They're one and the same thing. That's more controversial, but it has been defended, and uh, that that could offer a solution to the problem if it is indeed a problem. Um, but uh, perhaps it's the case that um, God's uh, God's cognition or God's mental activity is such that God can actually have thoughts about individuals not just generic templates of creatures but individual specific individuals that he may or may not create um i'm not sure i see anything that would rule out god conceptually having an idea not just of a kind of creature that he could create 
but a, a specific creature. Um, and if so, then, then that gets you around the problem as well. I mean, it, you're getting into some pretty deep metaphysical waters um, when you talk about individual essences or as they're sometimes called uh, hexiates. Um, uh, so I don't know. I think, I think a divine conceptualist has a number of options. Um, nothing leaps out as being obviously the right answer. Um, but I'm not sure that this is, I don't think this is a problem that's unique to divine conceptualists. And maybe divine conceptualists have some advantages insofar as if God is able to conceive of individuals before they exist, if God can have an idea of me specifically before I exist, then, then that can serve, that can play the role of an individual essence that guarantees that it is me as an individual who is created and not some, um, some uh, replica of me that has all the same properties but isn't strictly identical to me. Those are just some, some thoughts in answer. All right. And then we have a question from um, B. Bollant. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it. It's a little difficult. But uh, they ask, what do you think distinguishes the Vantillian approach in the field of contemporary Christian philosophy? Bit of a broad question. What distinguishes the Vantillian approach in contemporary Christian? Well, could you repeat the question again so I get the... Uh... Yeah, the question right. is just what distinguishes the, uh, or what do you think distinguishes the Vantillian approach in the field of contemporary Christian philosophy? I think what distinguishes it would be several items. I don't, I'm not sure there's one specific distinguishing feature. One would be a commitment to not just Christian theology in general, but to a reformed Christian theology, which is committed to certain claims about God's sovereignty, God's aseity, and the nature of divine revelation. So there's a, there's a set of theological presuppositions behind a, a Vantillian approach that I think distinguishes it. But also, um, I would say it is... Uh, it is distinguished by a, a commitment to two principles. One is a no neutrality principle, that epistemologically there's no uh, religiously neutral position that you can take on any issue, including any philosophical issue. That'd be one principle, what I call the no neutrality principle, that um, one's always going to come to any philosophical issue from a standpoint where one is presupposing certain things, including certain theological assumptions. And then closely related to that would be what I call the no autonomy principle, that there is uh, no um, intellectual or epistemological autonomy in the sense of independence of God and God's revelation. That is to say, another way to, to put the point would be um, that Vantillians are committed to the idea that when human beings think and reason, they are doing so in submission to God and God's revelation and are uh, thinking derivatively rather than uh, originally or independently. So um, as is often said, we're thinking God's thoughts after him. But there's basically a commitment to the God and God's revelation as an ultimate authority, a controlling authority over all human thought, including um, philosophical uh, activities. So that would distinguish Vantillian approach from uh, some approaches to Christian philosophy that treat philosophy as a kind of an independent discipline that you can you can engage in from sort of um, neutral first principles, and then you get so far, and then you can come into conversation with Christian theology. Uh, no, a, a Vantillian is going to say that you're you're starting from a stance of explicit commitment to a theological worldview, and you're doing your philosoph philosophizing within the context of the commitment to that, a prior commitment to, to a theological worldview. All right. 
Uh, I don't know if, if uh, Bela wants to come back on that. Maybe maybe he was getting at something other than um, what I thought I think he was. That he actually, I don't think he actually is here right now, unfortunately. He submitted it um, before the AMA started, but I guess he wasn't able to make it. He'll probably just be watching it afterwards on the recording. Um, but we can move on to uh, another question. Oh, by the way, um, Alex Malpass uh, heard about the, the event happening, but he couldn't make it, but he wanted... Uh, <laughs> to deliver the message that he said hi. So. Okay, I appreciate that. Hi, hi back to Alex if he gets around to listening to this. <laughs> okay. Um, so GIG actually is here now and wants to um, ask a question on VC. He didn't get to hear your answers to his questions before, but GIG, um, you're invited to speak if you're able to come on stage. Uh, I invited you to speak again. Ah, there he is. Okay, perfect. I know my mic is horrible. Um, so what I might do is just kind of throw just a few. Um, I won't hang around long. Um, and I appreciate you answering my previous questions. And I look forward to the recording so I can see how you answered them. Um, my okay. first question, would you, disagree with, um, would you disagree with Dr. Clark as he characterizes the persons of the Trinities as just bundles of the propositions they think? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Can you elaborate I mean, I, I, a little bit? Sure. I mean, I'm not sure what to make sense of that, or how to make sense of that, because if if you're saying that a person just is a bundle of propositions, you can't then say that those propositions are thoughts of a person or belong to a person. So on, on the one hand, you've got the claim that persons just are bundles of propositions. On the other, you've got some kind of claim that the propositions are propositions thought by someone or other. But if they're thought by someone or other, then the person that is having those thoughts, that is entertaining those propositions, can't be identical in whole or in part to the propositions themselves. So the way the position is stated, I, I mean, maybe it's just, my inability to grasp what's being said, but I, I, it seems it's just a very dubious coherence to me. And then another issue I have with it is that um, I think persons have to have a, there has to be a unity to a person that a, a bundle of propositions doesn't have, or a collection of propositions or a set of propositions. There has to be some ground for why some propositions are collected with other propositions as, as a person, as a divine person, as opposed to other propositions. And it seems to me that whatever you're going to appeal to, to provide the unity uh, within some particular bundle or collection of propositions, that thing, rather than the propositions themselves, is, is going to be the, the real person or the subject or the, the thinker of those propositions. So those are some initial thoughts on the claim. Perhaps you want to come back. Maybe I've missed the mark completely. Yeah. No. Um, would you say that God's thoughts are identical to Himself? In a certain sense, they are. Um, so I I take the view that divine thoughts are a a subcategory of divine actions in general, specifically divine mental acts. So. Um, I'm certainly inclined to the view that uh, divine thoughts are not something above and beyond God, but are God's, God's intellectual actions or activities that are ultimately identical to God himself. Having said that, I recognize that there are some difficulties with that position, and they are difficulties that are associated with the doctrine of divine simplicity anyway. They're, they're, the sort of problems that those who are committed to divine simplicity have to wrestle with, whether they are uh, conceptualist, divine conceptualist like I am or not, because you've got the broader issue of how one distinguishes um, what appear to be a diversity of divine actions. Um, so that's a start in answer to your question, but I'm, I suspect there's probably a follow-up lurking. Um, uh... There's this part, like my mind is like, uh, I'm thinking of like a million different things. So uh, <laughs> I guess a total sidetrack to that. 
Um, would you say that, um, okay, do you think the gods thought to create the world um, was true sans creation or before creation? Well, that's, there are two different questions there. There's the before creation. Um, and I don't think there literally is a before creation because I'm, I take the view that God is atemporal. So I, I don't think that, there, that it makes sense to speak about a, a before creation. But uh, the sans creation, does, is God's thought, um, is God's thought that he created the world true or are God's thoughts about creation true sans creation? Well, they couldn't be literally true sans creation because if there were no creation, there would be no truths about that creation. But there are, there are truths in a logical sense. There's an explanatory priority insofar as God, God conceives in some sense of the world that he's going to create. And that, that blueprint, as it were, that divine blueprint of course, then is what God implements. So God actualizes the world that he conceives. So in, in some sense, there are truths about creation that explanatorily precede the, the existence of the creation itself. But we, we have to qualify those and say that those are really truths about God's intentions or decree to create uh, rather than truths about the creation itself because those truths um, are dependent on the existence of the creation, right? Would not imply necessitarianism. I'm sorry, say that again. How would this not imply necessitarianism? Well, let me turn it around and ask you: Why do you think it would imply necessitarianism? Because God's thoughts are eternal and are unchanging, and He knows that He's going to create the world in a particular way. Right, but you're com you're confusing two categories. Uh, eternality and necessity, okay? So uh, something that is eternal can still be contingent in the sense that it could have been otherwise. In other words, there, there's, there's, the, there's the category of, of temporality and then there's a category, category of modality. So modality is, is concerned with things like necessity, contingency, possibility, whereas temporality concerns whether something is true at a time or true timelessly. And something can be true eternally without being true necessarily, that is without being true of necessity. So it's a, it's a category error to say that if something is true eternally, then it must also be true necessarily. That's confusing the, the categories of temporality and uh, modality. Um, so I, I, I don't see anything incoherent about saying that some of some some truths are contingent truths including let's say god's uh decision to make the world so uh, god's decision to create i think was a uh a free action in the sense that uh, it could have been otherwise god god could have decided not to create that decision was an eternal decision it didn't come into existence at a particular point of time because god is eternal but the fact that it is eternal doesn't mean that it's logically necessary or metaphysically necessary. That's, as far as I can see, that's entirely compatible with it being a free or contingent decision. So that's my basic answer. Very good. And I'll, um, you said a lot, so I'll listen to the recording and be sure. I guess my last, um, my last thing, or I have two, okay, my last thing regarding that, and then I have another separate question. Oh, we need to we need to move on after this actually. So if you could just do one one of the questions, then um, that would be great because it's been like almost ten minutes and we only have about half an hour left. Oh boy. Okay. Um, would you say there's mm -hmm. a reason that God created World X over World Y? And if so, how does that not imply necessitarianism? And I'll yeah. listen to the answer. Yeah. No, that's that that's an that's an excellent question. Um, I think. I think, of course, God has reasons for the uh, decisions that he makes or the things that he decrees. Um, whether they have to be uh, sufficient reasons in, insofar as that God has some set of reasons 
that necessitate some choice over some other choice. I'm not sure why um, why a Christian theist needs to be committed to that. It seems to be enough to say that God has reasons for every choice that he makes without going so far as to say that those have to be necessitating reasons. I think one has to leave some room for what we might call um, sheer divine contingency or um, sheer divine spontaneity. Um, perhaps there are perhaps there are multiple possible worlds. Perhaps there's a even an infinite number of possible worlds that, from God's perspective, are uh, equally good, equally glorifying to Him, and um, He simply chooses one, and there's no necessitating reason why. Um, if someone says, well, that would just be arbitrary, well, uh, that seems to be just, I don't know, uh, attaching a, a label to something to make it sound bad. Um, it wouldn't be arbitrary in the sense that there was no reason behind it. God would still have reasons, but why God has to have necessitating reasons for every decision over against every other decision or every one alternative over all other alternatives, I'm not sure why that is the case. Um, and I think if if we want to avoid, we, we might reason backwards from a rejection of necessitarianism. That is to say, I might start with the intuition that some things are necessarily true, but some things are contingently true. I mean, it certainly seems to me a contingent fact that I um, I got out of bed at one time this morning, but I might have got out of bed at another time. It seems perfectly uh, straightforward and intuitive to me that there are there are possible worlds in which I got out of bed a minute earlier and a possible world in which I got out of bed a minute later this morning. Um, and if I start with that, I think fairly solid intuition that there are some contingencies, then ultimately those contingencies have to trace back to the will of God. Certainly if I'm committed as I am to a generally reformed view of God's creation and providence, where ultimately all, all contingencies are grounded in the divine will, then there could be reasons why God decrees one thing over another, but maybe not necessitating reasons. Um, I mean, Aquinas talks uh, in terms of, of fittingness. He has this category of fittingness that is somewhere between sheer contingency or sheer, sheer possibility and uh, necessity. And perhaps that's what we need to say. Maybe that's, uh, that's as far as we can go in discussing this, that there, there's a fittingness to the world that God has created, but it isn't a necessitating factor. Um, I'm not sure. If there's anything more we can say beyond that. All right. Well, thank you for your questions, G.I. Jew. Um, oh, Dr. Anderson, uh, Ballant wanted wanted me to let you know that he actually liked your answer. Uh, apparently he was listening before. I just couldn't see him in the audience <laughs> for some reason. Yeah, I see. Um, I see him there. So hi, Ballant. Um, good to have you. Um, but yeah, now we're going to move on to another questioner. Um, Josh actually wanted to... Um, want to ask over voice. So I will accept the speaking request here. Josh, can you, ah, there you are. Oh uh, yeah, um, hi, Dr. Anderson. Uh, so I have a hi. few, uh, I just want to preface this because I, I got here late. So I, if you already answered this question, just you know, tell me to shut up and go away uh, and listen to the <laughs> recording because I will. But uh, it's kind of like, uh, another preface to this question is that I think there are two issues and they're kind of related. And so I kind of want you to address the, the, um, them both in the same answer. Part of them, part of it deals with, uh, you know, Alex Malpass's uh, response to the Lord of non-contradiction. And then the other part of it is just what Peter Van Inwagen thinks about Platonism. And so uh, I don't know if you're uh, aware of what Van Inwagen thinks about Platonism. Uh, about Platonism, but you know, he thinks that there's problems with divine conceptualism because God would have to have had the concept of a triangle prior to the concept of a triangle. So he he thinks it's like um, he thinks that that it's like incoherent in that way. And I think that much of the same type of, of general critique about conceptualism that 
uh, mal pass forwards in that paper is, is basically the same critique wherein you know if we're supposed to understand uh, what God like entities like shapes or whatever as as merely concepts then um, you know what makes it the case that God has that concept rather than that other is going to be grounded by virtue of you know God's thinking that he has that concept and um, and so there's going to be a sort of like vicious regress there so I, if you've already addressed that you you can tell me to to uh, listen back to the recording, but if not, that's that's what I'm curious about. That's a great question. Um, I I haven't addressed that in anything I've said previously, although there were, was another question that that touched on a similar issue. Um, so the the I think the I think the objection. I'm not I'm not so familiar with the way Van Inwagen puts it. Um, but I'm I am familiar with Malpass's critique. So the objection seems to be that um, in order for for God to um, have the thought that two plus two equals four, um, God has to have the the concept of that proposition. Um, and then in order to have that concept, there must be some prior concept. Uh, I think at the root of this objection is that there's a confusion between having a thought about a proposition and having a thought that is a proposition. And once you recognize that distinction, I think the regress goes away. When we say that two plus two equals four to take that proposition is a divine thought, we're not saying that God is thinking about the proposition that two plus two equals four that because that that would then uh leave open the question of well what is it that god is thinking about what is the object of god's thought we're actually denying that there is that distinction between the thought and its content so if you're starting with the assumption that every thought has some propositional content that is distinct from that thought then yes you are going to run into this infinite regress issue but we're saying we're we're cutting off that whole regress at the at the ankles, as it were, by denying that in the divine case, in the case of divine thoughts, that there is a distinction between the divine thought and the and the proposition that serves as the content of that thought. Now, certainly, God can have thoughts about propositions. We're not denying that God God can have thoughts about any object. But what we are denying is that uh, that when when we say that divine thoughts are propositions, that that involves God thinking about some object other than that it, that is distinct from the thought itself. That's what we're denying. We're saying that the, the thought itself just is identical to the proposition that we think when we think the same thing. So in our case, the proposition that two plus two equals four that exists independently of us and when we think that two plus two equals four then that proposition serves as the content the propositional content of our thoughts but there is a real distinction between our thoughts and the propositional content but in in the divine case in the case of divine thoughts when god thinks that two plus two equals four that isn't god conceiving of something else or thinking about some object some proposition or some content no the the thought itself is the proposition and actually part of the beauty of the divine conceptualist view is that it does avoid that kind of um infinite regress or having to posit propositions that are these i think strange um ethereal uh abstract entities that just seem to exist eternally and necessarily alongside God and that serve as the the content the propositional content of his thoughts it's a much uh, divine conceptualism is a much uh, simpler neater I think elegant account of propositions in in comparison to something like Van Inwagen's um, Platonist or Phrygian uh, account which I think it is does that answer the question at all does that help um i guess we the, don't know <laughs> it seems like he 
he left the stage. Uh, I'm not sure okay. he did that intentionally or I think yeah, maybe he said, he said I think no. Leave. He said I think though in the discussion channel. So I guess uh, it okay. does answer his question. Yeah. All right, thank you for the yeah, question. I, I'm I think that uh, Dr. Welty and I will be uh, writing up a response at some point, trying to publish a response to some of these objections, uh, including Alex Malpass's um, objections, which are you know very uh, well considered, serious objections to the argument, and they they definitely deserve a um, a more more rigorous and well articulated response than than I'm giving here. But at least that gives I think some indication of the direction that we would take. All right. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. So next we have a question from DGH, uh, who asks, does Platonism have an advantage over divine conceptualism when it comes to properties and numbers? Hmm. Um, so, yeah, so our, our account uh, is, a, is an account of uh, propositions. So that's a different, different kind of abstract entities. And um, Greg Welty and his uh, doctoral work has also argued for um, possible worlds, uh, a, a theistic account of possible worlds. But when we've got um, other abstract entities like properties and numbers, um, the question is, what would they what would they look like on a um, divine conceptualist account? Uh, perhaps properties properties might be um, divine. Uh, paradigms for the ways that things could be. So uh, the property of being uh, circular uh, might just reduce to the God's idea of um, how, a thing, how a thing would be as opposed to other ways that it could be geometrically speaking. Um, so this is not something that I I've developed, but uh, I think that there's there's scope for a conceptualist account of of uh, properties, at least if we're talking about created properties. Um, properties that we would describe to God need to be dealt with in a different way, and that's where issues pertaining to divine simplicity have to come in. Um, so we we ascribe properties to God, loosely speaking, like um, omnipotence, uh, omniscience, wisdom and so forth um and they need to be handled in a different way i don't think a divine conceptualist account uh would work there because of what is called the the bootstrapping problem you you have to explain how how god could uh generate the properties that he himself exemplifies so something along the lines of divine simplicity is going to have to be the the route to take there um, but a conceptualist account of properties uh, i think if they're created properties the sort of properties possessed by created things, that, that has some mileage. As for uh, numbers, well, that's another uh, interesting question and not one that I've delved into. Um, I'm certainly inclined towards realism about numbers. That is to say, I think that uh, mathematics is a field that deals with an objective reality. I reject conventionalist or fictionalist accounts of mathematical truths. I think mathematical truths um, need to be understood in a realist way. And that means that there have to be mathematical objects. There have to be entities of some kind that mathematics is describing. And obviously they're not physical, or at least it seems obvious to me that they're not physical things. Um, they are abstract things like, like numbers and uh, other kind of uh, mathematical entities. So I'm certainly uh, inclined towards realism about mathematical objects. But how would you handle that on a conceptualist account? Well, there have been some in, there's been some interesting work on uh, how uh, divine conceptualism might account for uh, sets, S-E-T-S, sets, sets of things or collections of things, arguing that um, uh, sets turn out to be uh, divine collections. That is God's specific cognitive activity of collecting objects together into particular sets. And um, I'm trying to remember, I think it's Christopher Menzel has done some work on that in a few, few places. So if it is possible to reduce numbers to sets, as some have argued, that numbers, numbers ultimately reduce ontologically to sets, and sets are abstract entities, then divine conceptualism perhaps has some useful resources 
for explaining the metaphysical ground of, of numbers in that way. Um, I'm, I'm disinclined towards a Platonist uh, answer theologically because <laughs> I, just, I just don't like the idea of there being necessary eternal abstract entities that exist uh, alongside God in some sense and independent of God. As a, as a classical Christian theist, I want to say that everything that exists uh, is either identical to God or is the uh, creation of God in some in some form or other. Um, so theologically, I, I want to steer away from Platonism, really for the same sort of reasons that William Lane Craig wants to steer away from realism, although he he's willing to go so far as to defend nominalism um, or anti-realism about abstract entities. And I think that has its own problems. So uh, I still think that divine conceptualism is the right uh, middle road between uh, nominalism on the one hand that I don't think is really offers a satisfactory account of, of uh, abstract entities and Platonism on, on the other side. Um, so, yeah, I think there are there are theological reasons for steering away from Platonism. I think also um, uh, considerations of, of parsimony, that is to say Occam's razor, uh, trying to, to minimize your ontology or your ontological categories. If, if uh, abstractor like properties and numbers can somehow be reduced to divine activity. Sorry, my screen has just gone blank. Can you still hear me? Oh, I, I can still hear okay. you. Okay, good. Um, I think my screensaver clicked in because I hadn't moved my mouse at all. Uh, anyway, I was coming to the end. I think uh, I, I think uh, uh, considerations of simplicity or parsimony would steer us towards a conceptualist account as well. But I have I certainly haven't worked out the details, so that's you know that's an ongoing project, I suppose. All right. Uh, well, thank you for that. We'll now move on to um, Jonathan, who wanted to come onto the stage. So you're invited to speak, Jonathan. You accept that? Yep. Ah, there I'm you here. Go. Do you guys hear me okay? I know it's a bit windy out. Yeah. I can hear you. Okay, yeah. I wanted to add, th thanks for coming on, Dr. Anderson. I um, I appreciate your work and stuff like that. And I think Lord of Non-Contradiction is a, is a great paper. Um, and I was wondering, but, and it wasn't really about the Lord of Non-Contradiction. It was more so about your view. I, I take more interest in kind of the Mysterianism about the Trinity. And I, I wanted to, um, maybe understand your mysterianism so if you could like lay that like lay out the myster your particular mysterian position and then also comment on if you're familiar with like um augustine and aquinas's view the what's called like yeah. latin mysterianism, and what your thoughts are on that yeah yeah well that's that's a big question i'll i'll try and compress it down so my my mysterian view and this is now turning attention to a different area of my work away from the divine conceptualism to um, issues in really religious epistemology and philosophical theology. So my, my PhD thesis was really defending a twofold thesis. First, that there are central Christian doctrines that are paradoxical, unavoidably paradoxical in the sense that they involve a set of claims that appear to be logically inconsistent. And I focus on the doctrines of the Trinity and the Incarnation. Uh, so the first part of my thesis was to argue that there are paradoxical Christian doctrines in that carefully defined sense of apparently contradictory sets of propositions. And then the second part of it was to argue that it can still be rational to believe it. That is, um, there can, I basically extended Alvin Plantinga's epistemology to um, defend the claim that one can have a rational, epistemically warranted belief in a paradoxical doctrine. And I won't get into the details of that. But um, the first part of that was to argue for the paradoxicality of the Trinity and the Incarnation. And, and turning to the Trinity, uh, the, the simplest way I can put it is that there are there's sort of a set of core claims or there's a, there's a summary that we can make of the doctrine of the Trinity and it's been spelled out in different ways but one way to do it would be to say that um, 
uh, the Father, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. So each of the persons uh, is is God in some sense, and the, the is there actually needs some spelling out. But the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. And then the Father is not the Son, uh, the Father is not the Spirit, and the Son is not the Spirit. And then the last essential claim is that there is only one God. So each of the persons is God in some sense, uh, but each of the persons is not identical to the other two persons. And yet at the same time, there is only one God, there are not three gods. Um, and there are different ways of, of uh, sort of parsing out the is claims there, because a lot of how you understand the Trinity depends on what you what you understand by uh, the, the Father is God or the Father is divine or something of that nature. And there are what have been called social Trinitarian views, which basically say that um, for the Father, Son and the Spirit to be God is simply for them to have some divine nature or some set of divine attributes. Um, and then they try to explain that there is one God by saying, well, there, there's some sort of group unity there or unity of will. or um, But it's not a unity of, of substance. This is what I think social, Trinitarian, social Trinitarianism rejects, the idea that there is one divine substance. Um, whereas Latin Trinitarianism, and again, the, the, the labels are a little um, contested themselves. Uh, I think social Trinitarianism is fairly well established. There are people who are willing to embrace that label. Um, Latin Trinitarianism is maybe a more contentious view, but it's typically pegged to the views of Augustine and Aquinas, as you suggest, where the the unity of the Trinity is more than just sharing a common nature, a common set of attributes, but there is a a oneness of substance there in in other words there's one there's just one being there aren't three three divine beings that have some sort of group unity or community to them but rather there is one divine being but this divine being exists in three distinct persons and augustine famously uses some analogies to try and uh help us get some sort of cognitive grasp on that and uh, aquinas has his own uh, innovative way of of arguing that uh, this one substance um, has uh, distinct subsistent relations. So the persons of the Trinity are are uh, in in essence ways in which God relates to Himself. They're, they're internal subsistent relations in God, and that's what distinguishes the persons. Um, my my view, in short, is that I I think Latin Trinitarianism is right. I think social Trinitarianism. Uh, the, the basic problem with it is that it just isn't monotheistic. At the end of the day, it's, it's hard to really take seriously the claim that there is just one God on the social Trinitarian view. So Latin Trinitarians uh, are, are in a better position to say that they are genuinely monotheistic. There is just one God, there's one divine substance. Um, but the problem for Latin Trinitarians is explaining in... in um, perspicuously consistent terms how the persons of the trinity are truly distinct and not not identical uh in the sense of numerical identity so the father just is the son these are just different names for the same person ultimately in other words the challenge for latin trinitarians is how they avoid uh modalism or some version of modalism and uh, what I argue uh, in in the book is, and in my PhD thesis, which was published as a book, is that Latin Trinitarianism uh, is the orthodox version, but that it is paradoxical. So there are some Latin Trinitarians who say, no, 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 it's not, it's not paradoxical at all. Aquinas spelled this all out in a way that explains how it's logically consistent. And I'm just not persuaded. Um, I think uh, I think Aquinas, uh, his his view that uh, there is one divine substance and God is simple, metaphysically simple. I think that's right. But I don't think Aquinas or any other Latin Trinitarian has given us an account of the Trinity that isn't paradoxical. 
And so I think then you you'd need to start moving to the epistemological questions of how then do we justify belief in, in a paradoxical doctrine? And I, I argue that there's a way of understanding paradox that doesn't uh, require us to accept that there are genuine contradictions or that God's nature is intrinsically contradictory or illogical, but rather these are merely apparent contradictions that are a consequence of our cognitive limitations, our inability to, to grasp the fine metaphysical distinctions that would allow us to understand the relationships between the person and the, the substance of God. Um, so, so the paradox is really a consequence of, uh, or it's a manifestation of divine incompre incomprehensibility and human limitations, rather than some intrinsic uh, illogicality within within God. Um, that's the short version of it. Of course, there's a lot more to be said. There's all kinds of objections that have to be fielded to that. But the upshot is that, yeah, I would regard myself as a, as a Latin Trinitarian, but one who also thinks that Latin Trinitarianism is going to end up with some paradoxical aspects or paradoxical implications. All right. Um... And then we have another question from DGH. They ask, if the laws of logic are adverbially characterized, um, does, that, does that mean that they don't exist? If the laws of logic are adverbially characterized. Um, well, I think a lot hangs on what you mean by adverbially characterized. I suggested uh, that we can adopt a, an adverbial account of divine thoughts. But of course, that doesn't entail that divine thoughts don't exist. It's just uh, a way of speaking about divine thoughts or a way of capturing uh, some, a way of capturing uh, uh, claims about divine thoughts that don't imply that divine thoughts are, are, are entities distinct from God or components or parts of God. So an adverbial account, as I understand it, or at least as I'm applying it to divine conceptualism, isn't a nominalist strategy. It isn't designed to explain away propositions or to explain away divine thoughts, but rather to characterize them as ways in which God thinks. So a divine thought is God is God thinking in a certain way. That's that's what I mean by an adverbial account. It's not it's not intended as a nominalist or anti-realist strategy that seeks to avoid any kind of existential commitments to divine thoughts or abstract entities. Hopefully that clarifies things a bit. Uh, all right. So we only have a few minutes left here. Um, we we might start wrapping up in a minute, but a few people wanted me to ask a question um, about someone. I'm not sure if you've heard of them, but um, if you've heard of Darth Dawkins, they wanted to know what your thoughts are <laughs> on Darth Dawkins. No, I have not come across Darth Dawkins. Sounds like um, I should, he's, though. He's kind of a uh, famous or infamous, depending on how you look at it, um, presuppositionalist and uh, you know tag argument advocate on Discord. Um, okay, well, that's, my, that's why they were asking. my apologies to Darth Dawkins for not being familiar with his work. <laughs> um, sorry, can't comment. All right, that's fine. Um, so we'll do one more question from uh, Ubo, which is actually from a friend of theirs that um, wasn't able to attend the AMA themselves. But they ask, in the Ventilian approach, or more broadly, the Reformed approach to natural revelation, all objects of experience mediate knowledge of God to its audience. In what way or sense, then, would the example of a tree reveal God's nature or attributes to us? Could you repeat that again? Because there's, there's a lot packed into it. I want to make sure yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. processing um, it. So in the Ventilian approach, or more broadly, the Reformed approach to natural revelation, all objects of experience mediate knowledge of God to its audience. In what way or sense, then, would the example of a tree reveal God's nature or attributes to us? Okay. Um, well, I think what I want to say is that any, any created thing is, is going to reflect on a finite level the, the attributes of the creator. I mean, I, I'm quite inclined 
to the medieval or scholastic metaphysical principle that um, effects always reflect something of their causes. And so, for example, a, a tree, uh, to take that example, has, has existence, but it has a limited kind of existence. It has a contingent existence. And I would say that that contingent existence points to some deeper reality uh, that, that accounts for its being, but has being in and of itself. There isn't a contingent or dependent existence. So the mere, the mere existence of the tree, in some sense, points us to an ultimate ground of being or necessarily existent being. Uh, the tree also has certain uh, regularities to it. Um, it. It observes certain laws or it has an, an order to it. There's a, a both a unity and a diversity within the tree. Uh, there are certain, certain unifying features, but then the tree is, is diverse in certain respects. And, and I would say that that kind of unity and diversity ultimately points us back to the, the oneness and the manyness of God, that is the, the doctrine of the Trinity. At least that's, that would be my, my Vantillian view that all unity and plurality in the creation uh, ultimately traces back to a, a, uh, an archetypal unity and plurality within God in the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, you know, there may be other uh, attributes of the tree, uh, but really we're talking about general features. I don't think that there's something about one particular tree that gives us insight into the creator that an, another tree wouldn't. But, you know, the, the tree um, has a, uh, a, a functionality or a, a teleology to it. It's directed towards certain ends. It isn't just a haphazard, chaotic um collection of of atoms i would argue that the trees like any um biological organism have a teleology a functionality to them and that again points us back i think to a a first cause or a first um uh an, an ultimate final cause to put it in in those aristotelian terms uh god is the the ultimate source of all teleology and and directedness of things so we could talk about that uh, even aspects of the beauty and the goodness of the tree um, these again need to have some ultimate ground or or explanation and i suggest that those would those would trace back to attributes of god as well so i think uh there's a sense in which on the one hand and this was probably what the Apostle Paul has in mind in Romans 1, that in general, when we look at the, the world and we consider its, its beauty, its goodness, its orderliness, its complexity, there's a kind of an instinctive response that points us to a, a transcendent creator. Um, uh, so there's, there's a sort of an intuitive response, but also there's a kind of reflective, what we might call um, a reflective natural theology that takes the objects of nature and considers their specific features and what would what would be needed to account for those features as they appear to us. And uh, that would be a more conscious, uh, inferential kind of knowledge of God known through natural objects. So there are different paths, I think, that we could take here, some that are more immediate or intuitive, others that require a bit more um, inferential reflective activity on our part. All right. Well, we are now uh, at like the 90 minute mark or so. So we're going to wrap up now, but uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to come and come by and do this, uh, Dr. Anderson. Um, this, well, thank you. This, I appreciate I the invitation. Enjoyable and enlightening for everyone. Um, do you want to Take a second to shout out your your website and maybe any do you, if you have any papers or books um, that you've recently published or that are going to be published soon or anything anything you'd like oh, to promote. You can take sure. Thanks. That. No, I appreciate the the uh, the opportunity to do that. Um, basically, uh, my my website is sort of a, a one stop shop for all things James N. Anderson. Uh, it's www.prognosco.com, just like my handle here, Prognosco. Dot com and my my blog is on there i blog very very <laughs> um 
rarely intermittently, but uh, occasionally I, I, I blog about things. Uh, there are links to some of my articles, some of the ones that we've discussed here. There's some information on my publications. There's some video and audio. So, so that'd be the best place to go. And um, you know, if anyone wants to to follow up or get in touch with me about anything I've said here, uh, set me straight <laughs> on anything I've said. Uh, feel free to contact me through the website. All right, and we'd of course love to have you back on sometime if you're able to, you know, do this again at some point in the future. Um, we're always open to these sorts of things. Um, but with that, thank you for coming, Dr. Anderson. Thanks a lot, Stephen.